All attempts in our world to change the rules so that people of God face a choice. Compromise or face the consequences. What's your passion? What is something that you really feel strongly about that you need to do something about? The prediction in the Old Testament of the coming of Jesus was with remarkable accuracy. The same with the second coming of Jesus. And this same God allowed himself to be nailed to a cross to save you.
John, and thank you Peter, and thank you Nui, and thank you Joe, and thank you David, and thank you all, because you have helped to contribute to the worship of our God and Saviour this morning, as we all do. We want to be a house of worship, of prayer, of scripture, of mission, and of the word. And you can't be all those things without giving some time over to them, can you? And that's what we've done this morning, and I trust that it's been a blessing to you, even as we seek to bless our Lord and Saviour. We're reading from uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7. It's already been read for us, so this is where we're going to be spending just a few moments this morning. And, and I suppose as you see the big story that we've heard read for us by David, um, you get the point that Jesus upset the Pharisees by not following their rules. It might not surprise you to know that I've gotten into a bit of trouble over time. I've probably upset a few people by not following their rules. Typically, it's in ignorance. I don't intentionally set out to upset people to, by not following their rules, but it has happened. I remember one instance. I don't want to belittle this, but a, a letter was written to the Baptist Union of Queensland about it. So it's worth noting that in one of the churches that I was in, at one point, a letter of censor was written to the Baptist Union of Queensland because I, as a young man, moved the flowers from the... No, no, I'm. This is what this is actually really important point to understand about what happened. I moved the flowers from the communion table because we were having a youth service, and I moved the flowers. And to someone, that was a very powerful, important, significant tradition that honoured something important. And I, in my ignorance didn't realise and moved them. Now, had I known, I probably still would have moved them. Because you know what I'm like. But, but my point is this. We, there are so many of these things we carry. And we do not want to just relegate this to the Pharisees. Oh, those silly Pharisees and their silly little rules. We have to be very careful not to distance ourselves from this this morning as we think about this passage from Mark chapter 7. I've entitled this message, we are having trouble with the clicker this morning, Catherine, we might just have to, I'll have to tell you, the state of the heart, Mark chapter 7, and we've read verses 1 to 23, um, a, a big comment that's often made in our society today, when we're dealing with mental health in particular, this is a slogan that you see all over the place, and it's actually, we've even got special days set aside to it, where you ask a mate, are you Okay. And we've actually reduced it to four letters. Are you okay? This is, this is a significant strategy in our human thinking, in our world today, to address people's mental health. So let me ask you the question. Is the power in those four letters? Are you okay? Is that where the power lies to actually address and help and support people in their mental health? just in those four letters. I'd like to put to you that it's not actually the four letters or the question itself that has the power, but rather the relationship that exists behind someone being bothered to ask. The relationship of someone who cares, who says, hey, are you okay? You doing all right? I'm a little bit worried. I just want to check in. Are you okay? Because, of course, the very same thing can be done and completely miss the mark. I don't know whether you've noticed the handshaking culture of the church. Some churches, the pastor has to shake everybody's hand as they walk out the door. Typically, they'll stand at the door and shake everybody's hand. Um, that's Biden missing the mark there at one point. Just for those who, there's no one at the other end of that. But we were in a church at one point where the pastor had to shake everybody's hand. And in fact, he would walk up and he'd say, good morning, good morning, how are you going? Good morning, good morning, how are you going? Good morning, good morning, how are you going? And he would basically walk around 300 people and ask that question. 
And one Sunday he was talking to Tanya and she says, you've already asked me twice. So, so, so he had this culture of needing to shake a hand and ask how you're going, but it was actually devoid of the sticking around to hear the answer. Have you ever done that? How are you going? Please don't answer. It's almost like, a, you know, we, we ask it culturally without actually having, it's empty. We're saying, are you okay? But we don't really mean it. It's an empty cultural tradition that means nothing because there's no relationship behind it that wants to support and care. And you're going, wow, well, that's just completely off beam with what this passage is about, Joe. What the heck are you talking about? Well, we all want to feel that everything's going to be okay. All of us are prompted by a deep need in our heart, actually. I need to know everything's going to be okay. Please let everything be okay. Are you okay? Am I okay? Are we okay? We need to know the answer to this. And often what goes on in our mind worries us significantly. The cycling round of the anxious thoughts, the spiraling of the temptations, the self berating of all the things that we've not done that we should have done, or the things that we did that we shouldn't have done. Spiraling around our minds, and we go, I don't want to be okay. How can I make this okay? And our passage today shows, well, firstly, it shows the typical things that we do to try and feel okay. But I want to make this point as we start this morning, and I'm going to prove it to you from our passage. Religious rules, they're not going to make you okay. Religious rules will not make you okay. Religious rules can never replace the relationship that restores Why don't we actually say that out loud together? Let's say that. Religious rules can never replace relationship that restores. We want to be okay. We all need restoration. And I'm pretty certain that religious rules don't do it. But let's have a look. We do things to make ourselves feel better. Self-medication, you might call it. You might self-medicate through workaholism, trying to feel valuable by contribution to the world through work. You might self-medicate through Netflix and binge TV. People self-medicate through alcohol and drugs. People self-medicate through sexual relationships and and people self-medicate through all kinds of tools to distract us from the gnawing feeling deep inside that I'm not okay. Well, there's a religious option as well. There's a religious option to feeling okay. There's a religious preoccupation with rules. And the church slips into it as a way of trying to get a handle on the, I want to feel okay. I got to know that I'm okay. What can I do to make it okay? True? And so the Pharisees always show up and give Jesus a great teaching point. So the first thing I think we see from our passage this morning, as the Pharisees show up with Jesus sitting down with his disciples for lunch, is that one of the ways we try to make ourselves feel okay is by criticising others. We criticise others to make ourselves feel better. There's nothing like a good social media post to tear down that person who has the exact opposite opinion to me or that politician who doesn't swing the way that I do or lean the way that I do 
or that guy who's made their fortune, they must have, there must be some dirt on them to get to such a point of high position. Aussies love to t- tear down the tall poppies, don't we? Don't, uh, I don't want you to get a big head. I don't want to say anything too kind in case it inflates your ego. You know, we, we like to criticise and tear down. And so the Pharisees, we read in the passage earlier, it says in chapter 7, the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law had come from Jerusalem, gathered around Jesus. We heard last week that Jesus was in the Galilee region now. So they'd, this sounds like a hit squad. They'd been sent They weren't just the the crowd that was gathered. This was a delegation. And what was their goal? Oh, we want to see if Jesus is the Messiah. Nah, uh uh-uh, no more. They decided that in their first altercation. He's no Messiah. Now, they've come to criticise. They've come to tear down. They've come to find fault. Now, just get the context for a second. Pastor Keith shared last week about Jesus walking on water, and the week before that was Jesus feeding 5,000. And as far as we're concerned in the Gospel of Mark, that's like the last two days. Not even. Just the last day. Now, Mark does take a very rushed approach to things. He says, the next thing, and the next thing. So we don't actually know whether it was the next day or not, but what we do know, as Mark accounts it, Jesus fed 5,000 people. Jesus walked on water and the, disciple, the uh, Pharisees then decided to come and criticise him about washing hands. Well, really? Did you not just see the miracle? Did you not just hear about Jesus walking across the lake without a boat? And yet what are we doing? We're criticising about... Washing of hands. They're no longer looking for truth. They're trying to prove themselves right. And they're there to put this Jesus back in his place. So what does that tell us? It tells us that they were actually the standard by which things were being judged. What does that seem an awful lot like we hear a lot of today? Oh, that's just your opinion. Isn't that a common phrase in our culture today? That's just your opinion. Opinion. When we say to someone, that's just your opinion, what we're actually saying is, well, my opinion is different. And my opinion is the right one. What are we doing when we're talking about our opinions? We're setting ourselves up as the standard by which other things are judged. Think about it this way, a totem pole. And the people at the top are judging everybody else by the things that they're good at. So the Pharisees must have been pretty good at hand washing. Well, good for you. Now it tells us in verse 5 that it was handed down by the elders. But actually what they were really saying was us, as the representatives of the elders. Why do your disciples not wash their hands ceremonially like we say they should? Is really what's happening here. Now, is hand-washing really that big an issue? Well, let's read it. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law came from Jerusalem, gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled. Hmm, that's an interesting word. That is unwashed. Oh, well, that makes more sense. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they have given their hands a ceremonial washing holding to the traditions of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, kettles, and some manuscripts saying, and dining couches or seats. Maybe we should give your seats a bit of a spray before you sit on them this morning. Now, this idea of the washing of hands and the washing of cups and pitchers and kettles wasn't actually even in the law in the way that they were saying. There was a law regarding priests and sacrifices. So if you were a priest in the temple and you were handling the sacrifice after it had been sacrificed because the priests were able to eat 
of the sacrifice, they had to ceremonially wash their hands so that they didn't defile themselves. This was a picture in the temple of the holiness of God and of the sanctity that they were supposed to hold the sacrifice in as they dealt with it. But it wasn't for everyone. And Jesus had said in Matthew 23, verse 4, you'd recall, he says, you Pharisees, you know, you heap up burdens on other people and you don't lift a finger to help them. This was clearly one of those things. Now, it probably started with a good idea. We like to set up fences of protection. Parents do this with their children all the time, of course. We have a fence around our yard for their protection we set up fences of behavior don't do this because it could lead to that so it starts as a good idea but then they made them absolute and then they started judging everybody by their new absolute standards such as sabbath keeping now just just for the sake of seeing some of the we might find them a little bit humorous but they take them very seriously uh, one, th- these are some examples of the kinds of detailed fences that we put in place to protect us from doing the thing that's wrong. So the Pharisees and the Jewish people have a couple of uh, ones I'm just going to draw to your attention to do with Sabbath keeping. And the first is, you're not allowed to look in the mirror on the Sabbath. You're not allowed to look in the mirror on the Sabbath in case you see a grey hair and can't resist the temptation to pluck it because the plucking is considered work. Not your problem, is it, Juan? Shave the head, problem solved. Or false teeth. If your false teeth fall out on the Sabbath, you're not allowed to pick them up and put them back in because that's considered work. If you, and some will know this is much dearer to my heart than I wish it was, have to spit. I have a lot of mucus. Sorry about that. I do. I'm sorry. It's sad. Um, but if you have to spit and you happen to scuff your foot on the spit on the ground, that's considered work because you're cultivating the soil. Okay, so these are fences. And then, and then there's the Sabbath elevator. So the Sabbath elevator, you see these. These are current, current in, in Orthodox buildings in... in um, In Israel, the Sabbath elevator has an elevator that operates without the pressing of buttons. Because if you pressed a button on the Sabbath, that would be constituting work. And so as a result, they've made all these fence kind of... So what happens is the elevator goes to every floor every time. So if you need to get to the the, the top floor, you're in for a long wait. (laughs) If you're on your way down, you're in for a long wait. And if you need to get there in a hurry... You might take the stairs, but you can't take the stairs because there's only so far that you're allowed to walk and that's considered work. So these are the kinds of rules that we put in place. They're not the law, but they're protective law. And and the Jewish people have done this as a way of stopping themselves from doing the wrong thing. And, but then what we do is we make them absolute and we criticise others by them. And that's the point we're moving the flowers from the um, communion table becomes a big deal. Because we've taken something that's a good idea. Yeah, sure. It needs to happen. And we've made it absolute and we've criticised someone and judged them by it. So the first thing we do to try and feel better about ourselves, Pharisees certainly doing it with Jesus, they're feeling threatened by Jesus, is to criticise and put down others to lift ourselves up that we might feel better. The second thing that we see is to put on a show to make ourselves feel better. And where do we see this in the passage? Well, we see in verse 3, where it says the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing. Now think about what that means for a second. It means going into a public place, taking out the bowl or going to the bowl and doing the ceremony. What is a ceremony? A ceremony is a performance. It's a thing we do to show others. Ceremonies in and of themselves aren't bad, 
But sometimes we can make ourselves feel better by putting on a show that says, I'm better than you think I am. I'm going to project that I'm better than you think I am. I don't want you to see my weakness. I don't want you to see my insides. If you saw my insides, you'd sack me. And so we put on a show. And Jesus used the word hypocrites. Hypocrites simply means actors putting on a show. So a ceremony has the purpose of being seen, making a spectacle of their righteousness. I love this. In verse 4 it says, When they come to the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other tra traditions such as the washings of cups, pitchers and kettles probably surprise you to know that the word wash or washing in this case is baptize. They baptize their hands. They baptize their cups and pitchers and kettles. And in some translations, they even baptize their seats that they're sitting on. Now we baptized Rose Bowden last week because Scripture tells us to. She was confessing her faith. But now let's baptise the seats that you're sitting on so that you aren't defiled. Because you never know who was sitting there before you. You can see where this goes. So this word defiled, let's just think about it for a second. I mentioned it earlier. The word defiled is basically another word for sinful. Sitting on unclean chairs. Defiled equals unclean, and unclean equals sin. And so the Pharisees were washing their hands to deal with sin. Hebrews tells us that the sacrifice of bulls and goats and doves never dealt with sin. They were pointing, a ceremony, pointing to something greater. So the washing of hands can be seen as kind of like an Old Testament sacrifice, as well as the sacrifice of sheep and oxen and bulls and doves. We washed hands. By the way, after the destruction of the temple in AD 70, the temple was gone. So the Jewish people could no longer fulfill their sacrifice obligations to God. They couldn't kill anything anymore and let the blood pay for the remission of their sin. And so it, history tells us that their choice at the Council of Yamnia, just after 70 AD, when they had to work out, well, what do we do? Their choice was to replace the sacrifices with the keeping of the law. So the actual keeping of the law replaced the ability to not be able to keep the law. Go figure that one. Because the whole reason for the sacrifices was that we couldn't keep the law. So they replaced the sacrifices that solved the problem of not being able to keep the law with keeping the law. It's a whole lot more law, isn't it? So they moved to a behaviour-keeping-works-only kind of philosophy instead of a blood sacrifice. And so the Pharisees dealt with sin by public ceremonial behaviours. They saved themselves by keeping the law. Judging by appearances was really what this whole idea of putting on an act was. I'm just going to walk over here for a second, Neville, if you want to follow me. And when we judge by appearances, we can get it completely wrong. The story is told of an old, deaf, dishevelled man who walked into uh, a public house, that, like a pub, I suppose, in Vienna. And all the people who looked at him and they were kind of like, what's this old geezer doing here? Who are you? And he couldn't hear them because he was deaf what are you doing here? He says, I want to play the piano. They're like, no, you can't play the piano. Somehow he convinced them in his disheveled, deaf state to let him near the piano. And he sat down. 
and started to play. It turned out that this man was the great master, Beethoven. And I got some of his notes wrong, but anyway, he's dead. <laughs> but when we judge by appearances, we're only seeing what we see. We're getting it wrong. And then the third thing that we do, we make excuses. And we make our own rules to make ourselves feel better. And the Pharisees did this as well. Jesus points it out in verses 8 to 13. You have let go of the commandments of God. You're holding on to human traditions, he continued. You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, commandment, honour your father and mother. And then Jesus reminded them, and anyone who disobeyed this command was put to death. He says, and yet you say, if anyone declares that what might have been used to help mum and dad is, is Corbin, Corbin means devoted to God. It's kind of like a will. It's like putting, giving everything to the church when you die. Then you can actually keep spending it as you like and, and you don't have to look after your father and mother because it's been devoted to God. And, and you no longer have to do anything for father and mother. So what you've actually done is nullify the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down. And he says, and you do many things like that. The Pharisees had this way of making themselves feel better by explaining away God's law to do what they wanted. And how easy it is to get cut in this cyclical reasoning of our culture today. I often get, to get told, oh, but that's just your opinion. I'm like, look, if it was, I'd be happy enough to be up for debate. But when God says it, it's not actually really about whether I like it or don't like it, agree with it or don't agree with it. It's true. God says it. People want to explain away and make rules that set it aside. And the funny thing about this is that they started with God's law. They're the defenders of God's law. Everything they're on about is God's law. And yet they've actually taken one of God's laws, honour your father and mother, completely abandoned it through a loophole. And then they're talking to Jesus about washing hands and dishes. And yet the one that they're breaking, the law requires death, capital crime. So we make ourselves feel better by redefining, coming up with our own versions where we're the winners. But here's the problem. We don't actually feel better until we're better. Listen to verses 14 to 23. 14 says, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it's what comes out of a person that defiles him. Later in the house, when they said to him about this parable, he says, Are you, are you so dull? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? It doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. I'll just make, make that point to, um, no, I won't, I won't have a go at the vegans this morning. Oh, I just did. To all of my vegan brethren, I love you deeply. Um, gosh, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> He's, I should never do that. He says, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from, listen, from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. 
sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly, all these evils come from inside and defile or make a person a sinner. None of the placebos work. We don't actually feel better by using them. We might feel better for a minute, but they don't actually make us better because the problem is a problem of the heart. Jesus explains that the heart of the condition is the condition of the heart. Nothing that goes in defiles or makes sinful, but rather what's in the heart already is defiled. Verse 20 says, out of the heart comes, listen, just listen to this list for a second. Evil thoughts. Now, if we were to ask the question, what plagues our society today? It's the weight of the thoughts going round and round and round with nowhere to go. There's a new phrase, intrusive thoughts. Often when, when we talk about how people get stuck in various ruts, it's because they created grooves in their thinking. They just go round and round and round and round. That's the starting place. Evil thoughts is the starting place of all sin. And then he goes on in the list, sexual immorality. You might say, well, that's not me. The word is pornea. Theft. You might say, well, that's not me. Even a pencil. Or tax. Murder. Oh, that's not me. If you've thought with hatred in your heart, you've committed murder, Jesus says. Adultery. That's not me. If you've looked with lust, you've committed adultery of heart, Jesus says. And then we get to the next one on the list, greed. What defines Western culture more than this? Malice, you might call that getting even. We've disguised getting even as justice today. But our culture doesn't really mean justice. They mean getting even. Deceit. That's lying. Telling an untruth. Fraudulent. Not telling the whole truth. Lewdness. That's the advertising industry. Every Instagram post. Envy. The desire for what others have. Slander. Interesting how much we say simply for prayer and encouragement about someone else who's not present. Arrogance and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. You know, the world celebrates most of that list as their new virtues. There are entire magazines devoted to just saying who's sleeping with who in Hollywood. On oh, who's broken up with who. See, Jesus is nullifying their entire system of external behaviours but he's doing it so that he can truly solve it. The problem is not what you do. It's deeper than what you do. It starts with a battle for the mind through evil thoughts. What you do is caused by a heart that is broken, a heart that is unclean. But you know what? Jesus doesn't relieve them at this time. That's where the passage finishes. Jesus says to them, all these evils come from inside and defile a person. You get the sense of saying, well, is it, are you going to do something, Jesus? You've just, 
You've just told us that washing our hands doesn't fix anything. You just told us that following the religious rules doesn't fix anything. What are we supposed to do now? Uh, he doesn't diminish the weight of the problem. He shows us the ways that we try don't work. You know, sometimes we need a stern reminder of the problem. Jesus never diminished the sin. He gave us that list. He emphasized it and gave us the opportunity for some self-analysis. See, the problem is the human heart. And when we say the human heart, we mean the human soul. And when we say the human soul, we mean the seat of our thinking, our personality, our way, everything that's in us. The greatest challenge we face at this moment is mental health. But mental health is another way of saying our stinking thinking. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says that the heart, the soul, the stinking thinking of man and woman is deceitfully wicked beyond cure. The prophet Jeremiah, under the inspiration of God, said that the mind, the heart is irredeemable. It can't be fixed. There's no patch-up job will work. Proverbs 23 verse 7 says, Whatsoever a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And Matthew 12, 34, Jesus explains that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. If it comes out of your mouth, it was in your heart first. The heart is the problem. And we're stuck because we thought we could solve it with religious rules. We thought that we had to do the stuff. The Pharisees certainly did. And now they're stuck and Jesus walks away. Where's John 3.16, Jesus? What are you going to do? And he says, I'll leave you to think about that for a little while. You see, we can't truly appreciate a cure if we haven't first really understood the disease. Let's say I say, look, you've got a sickness. And the cure is going to require you to have chemotherapy every week for three months. It's going to make you throw up. It's going to make you feel lousy. It's going to lose your hair. You're going to catch every illness that goes around if you're not careful because it'll damage your immune system. So when would you like to start? Or if the doctor comes to you and says, look, the results are in. You've got cancer. It's bad. It's actually really bad. If we don't intervene immediately, within three months, you're likely to meet your maker. And if we don't do anything, it's going to get worse and worse and you'll suffer great pain and discomfort and in the end, you'll die. But we've got some good tools for helping you in that. But there is something that I can do that will save you. It's not quite as bad as the other. It's called chemotherapy. It'll take three months, once a week, every week for three months. It'll make you feel a bit sick. You're probably going to throw up, lose your hair. You'll probably catch the, the colds and flus that come around. But at the end of it, we're going to get rid of that cancer. Which one's more likely to actually appreciate and appropriate the cure? Sometimes we need to sit with the weight of the problem first. And two, two final thoughts as we close on this this morning. The, the thought I had as I read through this and I was thinking, where would I leave it with you this morning, is this, that Satan opposes grace. Satan opposes grace. What was going on here? 7 verse 2, it says, 
Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw him and his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled. What was actually going on here before the Pharisees showed up? Was Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, sitting around having some food with his mates? That was what was actually going on, right? We don't see any evidence of Jesus teaching them something, belittling them for their faith, lack of faith, challenging them about their sinful people. What we see is Jesus hanging out with his disciples. There was nothing going on. And so what happened? Well, the legalists got into the middle of it and took what was going well, and they wanted to make an issue with it. There was no barrier. Jesus wasn't chastising them for the lack of faith. He wasn't teaching them. They were just in his presence. And Satan has, since the beginning, been trying to influence humanity away from simply abiding in God's presence. He wants to replace his presence with us, making our own judgment, making us be our own God. Genesis reminds us of his lie. It says, eat of that fruit. You too will be like God, knowing good from evil. And the impact of this continuing lie is for us to make our own versions of rules to replace God in ways that we can with our own thinking And it's the oldest of deceptions still pressing on us today. Jesus' relationship with his disciples sitting around eating food was broken by religious rule keepers coming in and creating a stir. But Jesus, in his discussion with the Pharisees and disciples, makes this point. It's not there. I have to go right back. Going back. There we go. Religious rules can never replace relationship that restores. You see, Jesus never let them off the hook at that moment. But we are the beneficiaries of the full story. Thanks be to God, we've received the full gospel. You see, Jesus came to clean the heart that was broken. He's made the point that baptizing dishes and hands doesn't solve the problem of defilement. And remember, the word defilement can be replaced with sin. John said when he saw him in the distance, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the defilement of the world, the sin of the world. Jesus came to take away sin. And then John quotes Jesus as saying, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep in John 10, 11. In Matthew 26, 28, we read that the blood of Christ, this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And in Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom You might say a sacrifice. We might go as far as saying a baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Religious rule keeping does nothing to solve the sin problem that plagues us all. But Jesus, through intentionally laying down his life as the one for all sacrifice, has baptized us. He has sacrificed himself for us. He has cleansed us. He's given us a new heart and forever changed the source of our thinking. He calls us now to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, only possible because of the heart transplant we've received from him. And then he calls us into relationship again. He had 12 disciples sitting around him, doing life, teaching, walking with him, and he calls us to the same. If you can do it through rules and rituals without Jesus, it's not Christianity. Here's a couple of thoughts as we, um, what, what you might do to respond to what we've heard this morning. I believe God is asking that some of us may have been following rules but not walking with Jesus. We might have been in the habit of going to church, 
Maybe you think it's a good thing and you're connecting with people and you go into a Bible study and you're reading the Bible, but you're not in a walk with Jesus. You don't have a new heart. He wants to give you a brand new heart and solve the problem. He says, repent and believe and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You'll be restored. Well, maybe, maybe you're one of these people, and we all can be these people, who criticise others by comparing them to our strengths, the things that we're good at, that we think everybody should be doing. I think that we need to remember that unless God gives a new heart, those things are completely empty. We should be very, very careful not to judge others by the journey that God brought us to over time. Often we take our end point where we are and expect it of people who arrive at the beginning of the journey or somewhere along the way. I think we should repent of our hypocrisy and show love. Or maybe you're just in that place where you're saying, yeah, Javen, this is all, this is all, um, I'm aware of all of this. I just want to continue to walk with Jesus and allow him to teach, guide and lead me. Why don't we pray and allow him to speak to our hearts on this. Father, we thank you for your word. We want to be a people who take your word seriously. We thank you that you've given this example of the Pharisees to remind us that we can very easily make ourselves feel better by judging others or criticising others, by changing the rules to suit ourselves, by holding others to standards that we're good at, elevating ourselves and knocking them down. But you tell us that the issue is an issue at the centre of the heart and we all need that new heart. And if we've been given that new heart, then you call us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And that's a supernatural work of grace as well. So we're placing ourselves here before you this morning, Lord, in that place where we're ready to receive the supernatural work of grace in our lives. We want to follow you in Jesus' name.